My first marriage ended. My life was a disaster. I thought I was ruined. I was like, well, these techniques are stupid. There's obviously no God. I was mistaken. And I got my experience just like running the show by myself in my, to the best of my ability. And I'm glad I had that experience because then I my life kind of shifted in that direction and it wasn't good. Yeah. And when it got bad enough and I was crying face down on the floor, oh, I wish there were a God. I wish there was a way. Mm -hmm. I came back to my techniques. I went ahead and I put God at the top of the page, even though I didn't mean it. And I think, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Like yeah. I've always received help even when I didn't believe, honestly. It wasn't always the help I had hoped for. I never, I couldn't save the relationship. I couldn't save the house I owned originally. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't save all that. But I came through, I came through and I began to shine again. And I gradually did have the privilege of becoming more myself and being loved. And Welcome to the Minimal Mom Podcast. Dawn reaches a million women each month with practical tips to simplify your home. Today, Dawn is joined by Anna from the popular YouTube channel, Crappy Childhood Fairy, where she teaches people to heal the adult symptoms of childhood trauma. Anna reaches millions each month teaching techniques and strategies anyone can use to calm dysregulation and change their lives for the better. Her mission is to change the paradigm of what's possible for people like her and to help all she can to heal and lead lives of joy and purpose. Anna, for those who don't know you, haven't got to, to meet you yet, why have you dedicated your life now to helping men and women overcome childhood PTSD or childhood trauma? <laughs> Thank you for yeah, asking right me that, Don. It's the most important question. What I figured out about how to recover from my own trauma, which was pretty bad, my symptoms were very, very bad. I wasn't able to go, you know, I was at the end of the road of how far I could get through life without any healing and nothing was helping me. And then I was shown something that helped get me on my feet again. And it was a long road to change my life after that. But all the things I learned and the mentorship I gathered, I've put together for other people because to be able to overcome the wounds of trauma is so, not just life changing, it's world changing. This world is really heavy with trauma and it's getting worse right now. And I think that's a big reason why it's so popular with people is to get some common sense help. You don't have to always go to an expert and wait for an appointment once a week, that there are things you can do right now to help heal your the neurological injury of trauma and help heal the life patterns that are so common for people like me. Yeah. And it's doable. And mm -hmm. especially when we help each other and you have good tools. Yeah. And Anna, you have some incredible tools. They're free. I mean, you have been so generous with how much um, that you have shared just for free. You have other things that people can, you know, sign up for and whatnot. But to get started is completely free. So we're going to talk about that um, when we get a little bit further into our conversation. I first was introduced to you by a YouTube video that you did about clutter as a trauma symptom. Mm. And so anyone who follows me is interested in simplifying and, and decluttering. Yeah. And uh, I have probably had that video sent to me by at least 20 different friends who are like, hey, have you seen this video? Have you seen this? Because <laughs> Anna, so many, they know the benefits of decluttering. We talk about it. Clutter causes stress and anxiety and, you know, but it's very chicken and egg. And that's what I appreciated so much about your video. Is it trauma is leading to my environment being <laughs> more messy and cluttered? Or is it, well, if I'll just simply declutter, then, you know, all my stress and my worry and my anxiety is going to go away. And it's not that simple. And so how have you seen clutter as a trauma symptom? Well, I grew up in a very cluttered house. I had a daddy and then I had a stepdad and my mom and my my biological dad, my real dad was he grew up very traumatized. I don't think my mother did so much and she, you know, she lived a pretty she was well supported by her parents. She was well educated, but both my parents had alcoholism and both of them had classic, you know, life problems that go with alcoholism. They were arguing, they were fighting. Um, they were destroying all of our belongings. Mm -hmm. The house was scary and unpredictable. And then when it, they they split up when I was seven, and then we were off in an environment where my mom had brought in like dodgy men, and we'd wake up in the morning and they'd be standing in the kitchen. And and even as a six year old, I knew I'm not safe, you know, mm -hmm. with people like that. And so there was all this stress in the house. 
And with drinking you'll and drug use, you'll often see this. Where I live, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we have a lot of homeless encampments and we have some of them like under freeways and things. And what I notice there is there's a kind of cluttery messiness there mm -hmm. that is associated often with methamphetamine use. Mm -hmm. And um, that's probably what it is, but that's a kind of scary mess that I'm very familiar with. I've seen it in various members of my family. And it's, it's actually really triggering me to see. I'm not a neat freak, mm. but I just feel triggered by that level of mess. So there was something early on in my experience that showed me like there can be like this underlying problem that expresses itself as mess everywhere. And, and I, I can't really understand it very well. Some of these things are a mystery, like the human soul is quite complicated. But I noticed because a lot of my fans were telling me and writing to me on YouTube, I'm just so depressed. I have all this clutter. I don't know what to do. I keep telling myself I'll mm -hmm. fix it. And, or I'm saving all this stuff from my family because I miss them. Or I'm holding on to this stuff and yet this was the abuser and I want to throw mm -hmm. it away, but I'm afraid to. So they were having a lot of the thoughts that people yeah. who are in the middle of cluttering have. And it just kept coming up and people kept saying, do a video on clutter. And I wasn't going to touch it because it was something that had been so painful. Mm -hmm. When I was in high school, I, um, I, the, a guy came over for lunch the day after Thanksgiving. We were going to have leftovers at my house. And I was having a panic attack. He just like came by. He's like, are you hanging out? Are you hungry? Um, should we, you know, do you have any leftovers? And I was just like, oh, he's going to come in the yeah, house. Right. Our, our house was just like filthy. Mm -hmm. And I have these strange legacy wounds of that where yeah. like, I don't like to eat shellfish or mayonnaise. And it's mm -hmm. like, hmm, what do they have in common? If they've been left out overnight, they can make you sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All the food is always was always left out overnight okay. at my house because yeah. people would drink and then, you know, yeah. everything would be left out. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I got out of the house just as soon as I could and started developing my own habits but I can see the effect of the clutter. And it was a lot of stuff. We have this heirloom um, trousseau chest that's 200 years old. It's been passed to the oldest daughter and the oldest daughter. And it's hand painted in Norway and it's beautiful. And it's it would have been quite valuable, but the top of it is just really damaged and the paint's rubbed off because it was covered in dust and grit and piled up with boxes. Mm -hmm. Just like nothing got cared yeah. for at home. So I used to think, well, that's alcoholism or that's the particular personalities of people in my family. Mm -hmm. But I've learned so much from doing YouTube. I'm sure you do yeah. too. Oh yeah. I've learned so much, you know, because yeah. you're in community with people who, who get you. And and they're they're putting in the comments, mm -hmm. do clutter, do clutter. And I said, Well, I think it's a trauma symptom. And that's how I started my video. I think it's a I think it's not necessarily um, the cause of depression that I think it coexists. It's a comorbidity. Yes. Now trauma can make people compulsive. It can fill your thinking with stressful thoughts. It can make you feel immobilized and unproductive. It does something to your neurology that is quite often expressed as cluttering behaviors. Accumulating stuff that you don't need and piling it up around your living space or working space intending to get organized at some point in the future, but not having the inner power to do that. And I think cluttering behavior is a trauma-driven version of something normal and natural that we call nesting behavior. And nesting, that's setting up your home space, making it comfortable and warm and orderly and well-stocked, which is a good and natural instinct. But like all good instincts, trauma can push this one over the line into something over the top. <laughs> and that's what cluttering is, that good instinct at an amplified level that makes it not good. And not all the time. And I get these mm -hmm. comments sometimes when they're like, I'm a clutterer for a completely different reason. I don't have yeah. trauma. And I'm like, of course. Yes, you know, there's I'm many a reasons. I yes. a brain tumor, but not all <laughs> brain right. tumors. You know? and not all clutter is trauma, but when yeah. people are traumatized, I think there's a high propensity mm -hmm. towards cluttering. Yeah. And I've heard this too from so many because people like me come in that I've actually had a, it's been fairly easy for me to declutter my home. Um, I grew up in a messy house, but it wasn't, 
Um, and this is what's interesting between our stories. There was often times where I would, I would have been horrified to if a friend would have stopped over, but yet I've been able now to move into adulthood and be like, you know what? My mom was just really busy. She worked yeah. a full-time job. We lived on a farm. Um, no one had extra time for it. And she honestly prioritized the time with us and getting us to where we needed to go over cleaning. And so I could have grown up in a cluttered space, but now move into adulthood and be like, you know what? I really see a value for decluttering, for simple living. And I I was, I've been able to work through my stuff. And so it's very easy for me now to project onto others and be like, oh, just let it go. Don't worry. Like you can get a new one if you need to. It's so nice. My house is so peaceful. But I have my a friend Lori from our mentorship group. And, and you know, Lori, um, she was getting her house decluttered. And she's like, this feels horrible. It's scary. Uh, like, who am I now? And there, there can also almost be comfort that comes from the clutter. And so again, this is, it's a lot to unravel. And so I really appreciate your perspective. And so tell us a little bit, how does it, for those, again, who have watched me, they're like, I want a decluttered home. I want a peaceful home. But how does our emotional dysregulation play into it where I could maybe declutter and still not find peace underneath all of this stuff? Sure. Well, dysregulation is not just emotional. That's the one that shows on the outside. Okay. And so dysregulation, um, just for people who may not know about dysregulation, there's a neurological injury when kids are neglected or abused. And it can be subtle, it can be dramatic. Some people just skate through and they don't, they don't seem affected. But it's really common for kids who, um, especially with neglect, uh, have difficulty processing information. There may be like a learning disability, ADHD type symptoms, which are sometimes CPTSD. There's emotional clutter. Like in my video, I talked about like all these different layers. There's like mental clutter, the thoughts mm -hmm. that you haven't processed that are just repeating and repeating, rumination, mm -hmm. dwelling on things, being too bothered to really be pr in present time. And then there's um, emotional clutter, which is you can't let go the pain of things. You're still hooked on what happened, you're still identified with your trauma. And then there's calendar clutter, you're just mm -hmm. trying to do too much. And I think a lot of us do that. It's sort of expected of women in, in, who are mm -hmm. older than 20 and younger than yeah. 90. <laughs> <You know? laughs> mm -hmm. We have to do a lot. And, um, and then romantic clutter for a lot of mm -hmm. single people where yeah. there's half relationships all over the place. It's There's not true emotional availability for a good relationship because there's all these sort of quasi Side, everything from side chick to pint, you know, longing for somebody who you used to be with. And it clutters up your light. You know, that light can't mm -hmm. shine that attracts a healthy person. And so there's these different levels of clutter and all of them seem to manifest at once. They're like all mm -hmm. really common. And, yeah. and if you ask somebody who was emotionally neglected as a kid or materially neglected, I was, I had both. Mm -hmm. You'll find there's some, there, it's usually like, <laughs> like, it's like the dashboard on the car, you know, you're out of gas here, you got too much heat over here. And your nervous system is having trouble regulating and processing information and even um, causing your endocrine system to, to, to release hormones at the right time. Girls go into puberty too early. Menopause comes too early. Mm -hmm things like that. Um, we have difficulty with insulin and leptin, countering it and making us feel full afterwards. There's a very high rate of obesity for women who are sexually abused. And they used to just sort of psychologize that and say, oh, you're just avoiding sex. Ah, it turns out <laughs> that it's very disruptive to the, hor the, to the hormones that govern appetite and metabolism. Wow. So it's not necessarily some big self-sabotage mental thing. Right. right. There's, a, there's, there's a injury. And I find it so helpful and liberating to understand, look, you had an injury and yes, we have some maladapt maladaptive behaviors and we're working on those, but first to just know, okay, it's an injury. Now suddenly everything makes sense. Yeah. It's not all your fault. You have an injury and you can start with that. Yeah. So where do we start? If someone is saying, I, I am recognizing that maybe this is a little more complicated <laughs> than I thought. Mm -hmm. I, I just set out to declutter my house. I'm not, making yeah. progress and beating myself up over it really because mm -hmm. everyone else seems to be able to keep a tidy house and and i can't seem to mm -hmm. and so where do we start to unravel this so even if you don't know what your next step is yet consider just opening up to something better in your life because there's greatness in you and it needs room to breathe and grow beyond the trauma beyond what was done to you in the past 
And one way that you can begin to step into that good energy of change and growth is by decluttering. You can start where you are with just one closet or one thing on your calendar that needs to be taken off by ending a friendship that no longer serves you or by letting go of an old grudge that you held against someone that really is not going to change anything whether you have the grudge or not. When you make space in your life, some old trauma driven feelings and thoughts are definitely going to surface. And so to keep your decluttering steady and sustained and not fall back into it or start piling things up again in every sense of the word, you'll need tools to help you face and release the friction that arises, the feelings that used to get stuffed down by, by your inability to take action, you know, push it down, you know, keep avoiding. So if you want to open up to this and be able to process those feelings that come up, one thing I recommend to you is to try my daily practice techniques. They are free. It's a, it's an online course that you can complete. Um, well, you can learn the techniques in less than an hour and there's a whole bunch of FAQ videos to learn the fine points. That thing where everyone else seems to have an easy time with it and I don't mm -hmm. is always the clue. There's probably something going on that, that you're not causing. Okay. That's usually the cause. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there's, okay, I'm going to address this. I'm going to call it out because there's sometimes a lot of cultural support to, d to go into denial about our own role in things. Mm -hmm. There are some problems in life that actually I am causing. And <laughs> that's <laughs> when I was dysregulated, I used to make terrible relationship choices. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that I first learned how to re-regulate. And then I kept making terrible relationship choices, but they would be so much more obvious to me sooner. Uh, yeah. And the whole thing would sort of collapse. When you're re-regulated, it has a way of sort of bringing the, you know how they say sunshine is the best disinfectant, mm -hmm. meaning truth, meaning facing right. reality. And so that's the problem is I think that all the levels of clutter, they block sunshine. Mm -hmm. And you can't, you can't quite see what's really going on. There's a sure. lot of cultural support to really, really focus on your parents and what they did. And no matter how bad it was, there's literally nothing you can do about that. Mm -hmm. And so I don't deny that what parents or other, you know, bullies, abusive siblings, teachers, you know, these terrible things have been done, you know, truly evil, touched little children with evil. And we have a decision to make when we've been touched in that way. I, and I say touched, and I wish I hadn't said that word because I, I don't mean to imply sexual abuse literally. I just mean that it enters into our consciousness when we were lied to, hit, you know, abused in some way, not had our needs met. I mean, it's, it, it is evil to leave a baby, you know, dirty and crying and unfed is evil. Mm -hmm. And it hurts. It hurts that person so badly. And so that happened to a lot of us. And we have a propensity to sort of carry on downstream with that the 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 current of that that wrong, that evil. Mm -hmm. And so we have to make a decision. We just have to make a decision. Are we going to try to become something more original of who we were really meant to be? Are we yeah. ready? Are we ready for that? And so this is where I differ a little bit with conventional approaches to treating trauma. For me, I used to go to therapy and it nearly killed me. Like talking about my mom, I could have talked for the rest of my life about everything she did. It was terrible. But every time I talk about it to this day, it tends to upset me, it dysregulates me, I can't process information again. Mm -hmm. So I used to pay I used to pay every bit of cash I had and go into debt and do it on credit cards trying to get more therapy so I would be okay. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't okay. And we were I was coming out of those appointments with my hands shaking, I couldn't drive the car. And I didn't have a word for it then. And the therapist, no matter how well trained they were, they didn't know what it was either. But I just had classic symptoms of complex PTSD. And that's the kind you get from chronic exposure mm -hmm. to stress, often in childhood. It could be later. Yeah. I just had classic signs. And they're beginning to figure out now on a scientific and um, academic level that you kind of need to work with the dysregulation first. But mm -hmm. that's what we do here. We do it in a very, I yeah. teach folk wisdom. This is how you can do it for yourself. You can do it right now. I recommend people do it every day. Yeah. Instead of talking about what happened, we do need to express what happened. Mostly we need to focus on what we're doing that's dysfunctional, mostly. Mm -hmm. But of course we need to talk about express and get, get a little validation sometimes for our struggles and what has happened. Mm -hmm. But it's it can be so much more helpful to, to write that 
rather than speak it. Okay. And there's, I think um, just last week, Andrew Huberman um, talked about some research from the 80s from um, a guy named Pennebaker in Texas, who we've known this for a while, writing can bypass these, these neurological triggers. Okay. So you can express and talk about something painful without talking about it. Interesting. <laughs> and talking, talking about it will reactivate that looping inability to process the information. Okay. And that's the nature of, that's, that's, that's the problem. That's mm -hmm. the thing that's getting in the way of just normal facing reality, solving problems. And what it does is when those, when that trigger is activated, and when I say trigger, I don't mean that common, you know, like online definition of I don't like it, it makes me uncomfortable or angry. I mean, a phenomenon, a, a stimulus that happens that sets off neurological dysregulation. And dysregulation okay. is the functions of your nervous system, which govern every part of your body, including many of the ways you think and your mood and your emotions. I, I mean, I believe we have a soul. It's not, your nervous system isn't, isn't God, but it's, yeah. it's running your whole body. And, okay. and so when that's dysregulated, it's, uh, it's your brain waves are going in a, you know, okay. <laughs> instead of like water flowing and you can feel that. There's some things you can feel, but other things mm -hmm. you can't. You can feel when your heart is going too fast. Mm -hmm. You can feel a panic attack, which is probably an expression of dysregulation. You can't feel when your blood flow is constricting necessarily. Mm -hmm. You can't feel, and that happens. It can. It means like I was in the hospital again and again, 14 times, all this surgery, couldn't get well when I was going through a lot of trauma as a young mom. Okay. And I couldn't heal. And I couldn't heal until I returned to my practice so that I could process my painful, resentful, fearful thoughts and have a spiritual connection again. I had sort of abandoned all of that and I couldn't heal my physical injuries. Wow. Yeah. So it's really powerful. And so they used to call that like psychosomatic, but it turns out it's we're not just like psychologizing or imagining or there's a there's a neurological effect to being under stress. And if you were under a lot of stress as a kid, there, sometimes there's an injury there. Yeah. Can we heal? Yes, there's a lot of neuroplasticity, probably not 100%. Some wounds are, some wounds are like a scrape. <laughs> some wounds are like the loss of a limb. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to grow another limb. But I don't know about you, but I know people who have lost a limb and they have a prosthetic and they, yeah. they really overcome, you know, yeah. been able to function quite well. But no, it's not the same as having your own leg. Right. And so it's a workaround. And, yeah. and that's what we do with trauma. And I have found that a lot of the problems of trauma, such as clutter, they will tend to clear up as a, they're like a secondary thing. That's why I have yeah. to worry. I think this is okay. a because when there's less clutter up here and in here, yeah, and in the um, in the romantic life and on the calendar, mm -hmm. and starting to have a simpler, clearer life, the stuff begins to disappear. It just feels natural to want to clear it up. Yeah. And that's, I mean, again, I didn't have the same experience growing up, but I have heard from others who have gone through your program. And again, it's very simple. It's very doable. And you have a free course to walk mm -hmm. everyone through it. I mean, it's a very simple practice. Um, but that once they were able to go through that, then they could start to declutter their home. And again, Lori had said, I mean, she was near hoarding level, but what you'll hear from many who hoard is that that actually in its in its unconventional way brings a sense of safety and security that when I have this stuff around me, I feel mm -hmm. safe. And mm -hmm. again, we know that that's not, not the most healthy way to feel safe in our house, right? Necessarily. But how can I even start to declutter again, if that's my safety and that's mm -hmm. where I'm getting my safety from. And so it was, it was so cool to hear her story about how yeah. as she went through this process. Now she's like, I don't need that stuff to, to be that pseudo safety that it, cause it wasn't actually creating safety. Right. And so, Anna, what would you say to those who are listening to this? Um, I mean, I'm hoping those who have experienced some childhood trauma, I, I hope they're hearing a message of hope and that there are things you can do and it does not have to cost. I mean, many of us have spent hundreds of and thousands mm -hmm. of dollars trying to to treat this. But for those of us who aren't in aren't having those experiences, we're recognizing this in people around us. I hear so mm -hmm. often, my mom hoards, uh, I know someone else, my spouse, they won't mm -hmm. let go of anything. What can you say to us to help us understand what is going on in their minds? And I mean, is there anything we can do to help? Do we have to wait till they're ready? How, how do we begin to broach this topic with them? I read the literature. I know that for some people it's OCD. I think someone in my family has um, hoarding caused by OCD. 
And I'm sure you talk about that, right? That's, that's one way that people can become cluttery. And sometimes I think that safety thing comes from it. So I'm just gonna give you a lot of theories. Sure. I know that the, the craving for safety, a lot of us tend to isolate in order to be safe. Okay. Like people are triggering. If you suffer from dysregulation, the cost of having like a disagreement or get a, getting your feelings hurt by somebody is so high to your ability to function and feel okay that it feels better to just like have a dog and stay away from everybody. Sure. So a lot of people are coping by doing that. And I, I notice, I just observe that cluttering often goes hand in hand with that. Mm -hmm that in that just sort of like, I, it's a, it's an isolation. It's an expression of isolation. Now I'm iconoclastic. If you, you know, whatever the psycho common psychological explanation is, I often try to go underneath and go, is that really true? Mm -hmm. Cause I know for me as a kid with trauma, you know, I was always misunderstood. They always thought they said, Oh, you're just trying to recreate your childhood. And I can just tell you with certainty, no, I've never tried to recreate my childhood. Yeah. That is not what I'm trying to do but you will see patterns that are common for traumatized people come up over and over again because, well, I think, I think it's neurological. I think that um, there's been a lot of people who have childhood trauma are carrying a heavy attachment wound mm -hmm. and the love wasn't, they weren't loved adequately. And it's totally understandable that sometimes the objects give a sense of having a family and having come from somewhere and, I have this Norwegian chest, this trousseau chest that's 200 years old. And so even though my mother, I feel very disconnected, she died a long time ago, but she was very remote from me and emotionally unavailable because of alcoholism. But that chest came from my grandmother and great grandmother and great grandmother. And the older I get, the more I just feel like I'm in a line, I'm in a family line. I'm not defined by my mother's neglect. Mm -hmm. So that's, there's the, <laughs> actually it's funny because I think we're pretty good about clutter, but my husband is, he always wants me to put that trunk away because, because <laughs> it doesn't really go and it, <laughs> it's like, no way. It's, it's so important. I want everybody who comes over to know. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I had to kind of look at that. Like, why is this so important to me? Yeah. He's also, he's from England and he's like, I just don't understand why you want ancestry.com or anything like that. Like mm. who cares what your ancestry is? I'm like, I care. Yeah. I, I care so much. And it, yeah. I think it might be an American thing that we're, <laughs> you know, we're ancestrally cut off after, you know, X number of years. Sure. From recently. It doesn't, we just don't go back very far in this mm -hmm. country, some of us. And so we're fascinated, but where, where did I come from? And so I've always enjoyed that, but I think that's part of it. And that's the connection. Now in my family with alcoholism and drugs, most people have died early and mm -hmm. they leave with all their possessions. And I've often been the person who had to go through their possessions and kind of figure out what to do. So here's mm -hmm. been my process. First, I save everything. <laughs> and then every six months or a year I go through and try to see, can I get rid of like the old coffee cups and things mm -hmm. that are, you know, and I've got it down now. And I've got like, I had a brother who died in his thirties from drugs and I've got a box about this big and it's, I've got some t-shirts and his bike helmet and some papers and his paints and just a few things, but it's not everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I feel like that's an expression of how much I have worked through. Cause he was a, he was a very abusive sibling, really probably worse than anybody in my family. And yet I love him complicated relationship. And so the saving of everything, it, it is an outward expression of not having processed all of that, that complicated thing of loving somebody yeah. who hurt you. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm an intelligent person. And I've known that since I was a kid, I'm, I'm a smart gal, but I really could not figure out like why I kept making such self-destructive choices. And the stuff that therapists would tell me or the culture would tell me didn't really speak to me about what that was about. Yeah. They'd say stuff like, you know, you really just need to love yourself. And I'd be like, what are you even talking about? You know, <laughs> it, just, it would just sound like stupid psychobabble to me. Yeah. I, it actually, for a person who has been injured in the way that many of us were as kids, that's nonsense. You don't just need to love yourself. You will love yourself as you heal because it's natural to love ourselves because we're beautiful and holy. Yeah. It's natural to love ourselves, but we're going through a very tough time with the wounds we're carrying. And we've been told a lot of bad things and had some experiences that validated the worst in us. And as we heal that stuff, the love comes. So how do we get there? For me, it began as a very spiritual process. And what I was shown, there was a woman who saved my life. I was really hitting bottom. My mother was dying. I had been attacked on the street. 
someone I loved so much and really had hoped to be with in my life decided to end it maybe a year before that. And uh, it wasn't, you could hardly even say it was a relationship, but it was important to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I was in a lot of pain when all of this happened and I felt like I couldn't go on. And a friend, she's still my friend. I just met with her last night. She is somebody who was in AA. I'm not an alcoholic. It would have been handy if I were because there would have been that to go to. <laughs> I acted like an alcoholic. <laughs> Very chaotic, couldn't get anywhere on time, you know, belligerent, weepy, you know, having a lot of emotional dysregulation. But after I got, I got attacked on the street. I got beaten unconscious by strangers. It's kind of this fluke. And maybe it wasn't a fluke, who knows? But I couldn't read. I couldn't really put my thoughts together. I couldn't use a phone. And the scan of my brain looked normal. So the doctors were just dismissive. They said, here, take some Xanax, which is terrible advice for somebody with a head injury, really. <laughs> but what I had was PTSD. And that'll often happen for people who had hard stuff in the past that they've done a good job of containing and managing. One bad thing happens or a couple bad things happen. A trauma storm hits and boom, it gets out. And then you can't stop it. You're drowning okay. in your own memories and feelings. And that happened to me. And there, the therapist didn't get it. She's like, let's talk about the assault again. Let's. So they walked up to you. Then what happened? The more I talked about it, the worse it got. The more I took you know, medication, the worse it got. And then by some miracle, I confided in this woman. I barely knew I was giving her a ride. And I said, I, you know, I think I'm going to have to end my life. And she was like, oh, I felt that way. Do you want to come have a cup of tea? And she, I went in and this has ended up being such an important night in my life. Yeah. She, we talked for a while and she, she really did understand me. And she said, do you want me to show you what I do? And she had been a homeless person on the street in her teens because of drinking. And she stopped drinking and she was doing AA and she was able to stop drinking, but she was miserable. The emotions yeah. and thoughts were just so much for her. And so, so she had learned this technique of you write your fears and resentments. I learned to write it as a prayer, which I was very resistant to at that time in my life, 30 years ago. And um, <laughs> said, well, you know, you don't really have anything to lose. You said you're not even going to be here tomorrow. So I don't know, maybe put God at the top. And so I did. And God, <laughs> she said, now write this. I have fear. Now write what you have fear about. Now for anybody listening, I really encourage you to learn the literal technique because if you don't do it exactly right, it can make you feel worse. So, you know, <laughs> Sign up for my free. We'll link to that. Yeah, for sure. But that's the essence of it. I got down on paper the thoughts that were knocking around in there like ping pong mm -hmm. balls and the fear, the resentment. And I had so much resentment. People used to say that you're a very angry woman. And I used to think, well, yeah, <laughs> what woman wouldn't be in this world. It's such a terrible world. You know? Just like, <laughs> really, like, I was really in it and uh, I didn't have any resources to strengthen me when it got hard and there was no one left in my life. You know, I just, I believed it was a terrible world. I got to be a real pain in the butt <laughs> for people. <laughs> I was alienating them. And this woman came along and she showed me how to write it down and then ask for it to be removed. And she said, now go learn to meditate so you can rest your mind. Mm -hmm. And I teach people a very simple form of meditation where you, you literally just rest. It's not in conflict with any other belief system. It's very yeah. simple. You don't even have to focus on your breath. You don't steal your mind. You don't your mind. You just close your eyes and go, uh. And we can all do that. Um, actually, it's kind of hard sometimes if your mm -hmm. mind is fidgety. And then uh, I experienced a great calming the first time I did it. Calm entered me. I was able to go to sleep later that morning. We stayed up all night talking. You know, it was so exciting for me. I was able to sleep and I woke up and I felt excited to do it again. And then I called her and read her what I wrote. And I was so excited to do it again. And like somewhere in that week, we took a walk and all of a sudden I was waking up to, I was like, wow, everything's green. There's rain. It's so beautiful. It's all alive. And I was like, wait a minute. I'm part of it. I'm mm. alive too. Like I'm yeah. as good and beautiful at least as the rocks. And yeah. the rocks, the rocks were like emanating light to my eyes. I was in the middle of a mirror. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, well, if the rocks shine, what am I, you know? Yeah couldn't possibly be somebody who doesn't belong here, mm. which is what I've been thinking. Yeah. So I knew I belonged and this new floor came under that depression I was carrying, you know, that I, I know I belong. I know I'm real. And, uh, and then I had a heap of problems and what I can look, I, after 30 years, the science wasn't there. I just kept doing this and I kept recovering within two weeks. 
I could go back to work with my head injury. And not only could I be at the office, but I could pay attention. I sat in a business meeting, like never in my life had I paid attention to an hour of other people talking. I was always like thinking, what am I going to say? Ooh, I'm uncomfortable. And is there coffee? And, and I'm offended. And, oh. and, <laughs> and I sat in a meeting and I was just listening and paying attention. And towards the end of the meeting, I said, well, this gives me a thought. And it turns out I have a strength. I'm pretty good at seeing the connection between things. And everybody in the meeting was just like, whoa, old mm -hmm. popcorn brain Anna over there just said something really useful that we hadn't yeah. seen before. Yeah. And so this strength of mine all of a sudden popped out and showed. And this was in just like two weeks. I don't guarantee that timeline for everybody. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe you're not as desperate as me. Everybody's different. But by doing it twice a day, it gave my brain an ability to re-regulate. I could re-regulate my nervous system. And then the, a lot of physical stuff cleared up. My Not just the attention span, my asthma went away, some back pain went away. A lot of stuff that may have been made worse by all the trauma mm -hmm. I was carrying. Yeah. And that will sometimes happen. We can't cure everything magically. You know, we're just, we're, we're mortal. Mm -hmm. but, but a lot of times our health problems are made worse or even caused by that, the level of dysregulation and stress in our nervous system. It can't bring the, uh, the antibodies. It can't bring the blood flow to heal the tissue. And so I have had that experience. I've had these amazing healings where I'm just like, how did that happen? It's like, oh, I couldn't, you know, the reason I was sick or I couldn't heal from the surgery was I, I, I was just too traumatized inside. I was just freaking out. Yeah. And so when I could start to re-regulate my nervous system, my body knew what to do. Mm. And, um, and nature ran its course. Yeah. And we are designed to heal. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we have amazing powers of healing in there and we're mortal and we die. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and I can already, though, I can already imagine women that might be listening to this though, ruling themselves out saying, oh, but I'm always the outlier. I'm always the one it doesn't work for. I'm always yeah. the, so what, what encouragement would you give to them today? <laughs> we put that on the paper. I have fear that I'm the outlier, fear nothing ever works for me. And most yeah. people who ever, you know, I, there's a lot of people who are using my techniques now and it would be rare that they haven't already tried a million things, yeah. not a million, but a dozen. But Many therapists, books, groups, self-help, you know, exercises, brain stuff where it's like, go look at the sun in the morning. All that stuff is good, but it can't, you can't really do anything with it until you learn how to re regulate. Yeah. And then you start to have choices um, and you can start to use your intuition about what might be a good way forward. I really encourage people not to hand off their healing to somebody else, to an authority outside themselves, unless mm -hmm. unless you're so mentally ill, you're a danger to yourself or others. Yeah. Then of course, somebody needs to step in for a while. Mm -hmm. But other than that, if you're just struggling with your CPTSD and clutter and relationships and money and all the things that tend to go with clutter, yeah. you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. that those things are a struggle, make yourself sovereign over your own healing and just begin to make your own decisions. It's, it sounds like a terrible curse to say nobody's coming to save you, but it's actually a wonderfully liberating truth. Mm. It's that you your good sense is in there somewhere and you need to access it. And you access that by re-regulating your nervous system. And so using my daily practice, this is, this is what I'm always encouraging people. If you do it twice a day, if you do it once in a while, like an aspirin, I guarantee you, it might help a little, yeah. but I say, no, use it like a toothbrush ah, okay, <laughs> yeah. twice mm -hmm. a day, you know, like really, it just keeps coming back. So you use it twice a day to try to open your mind. And sometimes you get a little relief from the pinging thoughts, maybe for half an hour, maybe three hours, maybe a whole afternoon. That is a blessing. And it's a time when some new information can come in. And if you're spiritual, you can receive your guidance during that time where it's too noisy. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's so noisy. You don't know, like, you can't tell the difference between your intuition, some divine inspiration and the television, frankly. Right. You know, <laughs> right. Totally. And I see that with decluttering, too, because decluttering is making 100 decisions in an hour and how many of us don't trust our own decision making, our intuition. What if I make a mistake? It's not OK to make mistakes. And so, again, we we oversimplify decluttering and, um, yeah. because it's really not. And you do have to have some ability to keep your thoughts in order and to trust your decisions and to feel like you are going to do a good job with it. Yeah. And then. And then this part two is you have to be totally free to make mistakes and have that be okay. Yeah. 
And so in the techniques I was using, that's also what set me free is if I make a mistake. So when I start using my da daily practice, I start, I don't need to isolate as much. I can go out there and maybe have a coffee with somebody who I yeah. feel a little nervous about. Yeah. Go on a date, take a class, you know, just stick my neck out a little, make a video on YouTube. Yeah. Oh, you know, the first time you did that, right? And then you get critical <laughs> comments. It's like, oh, I'm never going to make a video. They all again. hate me. I'm convinced. You know? Yes. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, terrible. And yes, I knew it. I shouldn't have tried. <laughs> and so where do we find the power to do that, to get back up and go, okay, mm -hmm. haters going to hate, yeah. but I'm going to make yeah. another video. I want to share this. And it's so exciting because you begin to share yourself with the world and the world shares itself back with you. And then you find out, oh, I'm not alone. And yeah. all that good stuff yeah. can finally reach you and friends and, you know, maybe a partner and maybe yeah. a decent income. And, mm -hmm. you know, all those things have come to me that I didn't have before yeah. um, and children well, it's funny. Even cats can have children, <laughs> but it really is like the best thing that ever happened. And it took a lot of um, inner healing for me to be able to receive that gift, you know, yeah. to yeah. to not freak out and think I have to run away from it. And, and uh, I just love my kids so much. And my kids use this practice too. Wow. And kids can use it. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't try to push adults to use it. But your question was like, where do you start is how can you begin to do that? The mistakes that we make. So I end up, I put my foot in it. I say things. Um, I've made horrible mistakes. I've, and especially, I mean, it took me years to stop having these really ill-advised relationships. I had blind spots that took a while. Okay. I had to get brave enough to ask for guidance from mentors who were formidable. Mm -hmm. And I used to avoid those people. Yeah. I used to avoid all healthy people altogether. <laughs> you know but but to get to start to recover enough to say you know you've known me a while from a distance and i know you know that i'm an f up and i've made a lot of mistakes and would you help me would you give me some advice on how i can do this differently i did that when i met my husband mm. i stopped dating i got that far but i met him and i was serious about him and i knew i would mess it up I'll be left to my own devices and so somebody who i never would have asked for their advice who i knew would help me and be straight with me they taught me how to change my manner mm -hmm. and my approach to the whole thing and slow down. And yeah. it, it made all the difference. And mm -hmm. uh, it's the only person I ever dated after I made a decision to do something differently. Wow. I just didn't even muck around. Yeah. I had kids, you know, you can't muck around with kids. <laughs> so a lot can change when you can release all that trauma. Now mm -hmm. I, I did these techniques for 12 years. My first marriage ended. My life was a disaster. I thought I was ruined. I was like, well, these techniques are stupid. There's obviously no God. I was mistaken. And I got my experience just like running the show by myself in my, to the best of my ability that way. And I'm glad I had that experience because then I my life kind of shifted in that direction and it wasn't good. Yeah. And when it got bad enough and I was crying face down on the floor, oh, I wish there were a God. I wish there was a way. Mm -hmm. I came back to my techniques. I went ahead and I put God at the top of the page, even though I didn't mean it. And I think you know, that's okay. It's okay. Like yeah. I've always received help even when I didn't believe, honestly. Mm -hmm. If I needed help, I always got help. Okay. <laughs> you know, I just yeah. got help. And then I sort of like, all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there's help. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it wasn't always the help I had hoped for. I never, I couldn't save the relationship. I couldn't save the house I owned originally. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't save all that. But I came through. I came through and I began to shine again. And I gradually did have the privilege of becoming more myself and being loved. And and um, we have this beautiful house we just bought. We couldn't buy a house. We've been married 10 years, my husband and I. And when we got together, we, um, when I met him, I had horrible debt and I don't blame myself. I was a single mom. I had been in and out of the hospital. It was pretty hard. And we live in California, but I got out of debt and we, um, we got married and we moved into a house and we sat down in a cafe and we said, somehow, you know, I was 50 years old when we got married, we've got to, we've got to find a way to pull our lives together. Um, and so that we can retire. My kids at the time were, 10 years ago, they would have been 10 and 14. You know, we had nothing for their college. We had nothing for retirement. We rented a house <laughs> and we set our minds to it. And I just have been very earnestly in my daily practice. there, just like, I don't know, show me what you need me to do and empowered to go. I went and took a seminar. I took some courses online. I reached out for advice from people 
and it takes power. You know, you can know the right thing to do to solve mm -hmm. your problems, yeah. but it takes power. I'm pointing to, I don't know, my heart or my tummy. <laughs> it fills me. This power yeah. comes and fills me sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Like if you've ever been really sick, I, I had some hemorrhages and when you've lost your blood, even when they give you a transfusion, you're just like, you have no power. Yeah. Like all your energy is going into trying to make copper and magnesium and yeah. red blood cells. You can't do anything. You know, I know what it is to be like physically powerless. I know what it is to be emotionally and spiritually powerless. And then to, to wake up in the morning and have a little enthusiasm for something is mm -hmm. such a good thing. Yeah. It's such a, such a sweet gift. You yeah. know, the sun comes yeah. up, and I, I want to get up. Yeah. Eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I want to try something. And I find that if I can declutter my mind, mm -hmm. it is as natural as the sun rising for me to fill up with that power and enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And that, that it can, it's a good thing. It's a good energy of mine. It, it, it comes from God. It's meant for me. Mm -hmm. And I, I complicate it sometimes. I yeah. waste it sometimes. I make mistakes. And then I try to get back on, be, get back in the saddle. And there's just certain things I can do is, you know, name the fears and resentments, ask for them to be removed. If I realize I've hurt people, just try to, I try to be honest about it. If I, if I, you know, was mean to my husband about something, I know it. I know, <laughs> I know I was. And the longer I spend, yeah. you know, festering and justifying myself, the longer mm -hmm. I'm going to lose that power inside. Yeah. And the sooner I can just go and say, I'm really sorry. I snapped at you, mm -hmm. you know? I didn't mean that. And, uh, you know, you're actually really great. I'm glad you're here. And then, whoop, then you just notice yeah. oh, here it comes again. Here it comes again. Here's my right. enthusiasm yeah. to take care of whatever it is I need to take care of today. Yeah. That's so good, Anna. And I, I love, uh, like I said, we'll link to, to your daily practice course. It's very simple and, and quick to go through. You're so trustworthy in this area because you have been through it and you do yeah. know. And, yeah. um, and so I really appreciate that. And I just even, I just, we'll, we'll link to your trauma or your clutter as a trauma symptom video too. I, you gave some really great examples in that video of just like the clutter, the physical clutter that you've had to work through and the reason, the logic, why you were hanging on to it and then how you let it go. I just, I found it very helpful and you're just so easy to listen to. You're very <laughs> relatable and not Thank judgmental you. at all. You're just like, come on friend, come alongside. Let's go yeah. clean out our makeup and you know, different you're like that too. You're like yeah. that too. People oh, love you. you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate, um, everything that you have to offer because there has been a big gap in this. I think there's so much awareness now of trauma, right? We hear that word everywhere, but the actual practical real life steps to be able to deal with it, it sometimes feels elusive. So I'm really, really grateful for, for yeah. everything that you've been able to offer and you rock it on YouTube. You're doing awesome. Thank you. you do too. I'm so happy to meet you so, personally. Yeah, no, <laughs> thank you. And I know mention too that um, you don't have to share the same faith beliefs that this, your program um, it's very neutral to all, all beliefs. Yeah. And I appreciate that as well. It, it lines up with Christian beliefs, but also with generic, it's more generic than that <laughs> too. It just you know, works you know, for what's, everybody. <laughs> what's lovely. I'm talking a little bit more about the, the Christian belief side of things here, but on my channel, we literally have every people of all faiths and none, and including yeah. you know women who are hiding in their basement in Pakistan because their husband can't know they're on you on Zoom, you know, yeah. <laughs> and Wiccans who in and and there's uh, I I really do try to make it yeah. a welcoming place for everybody to find it where they are as I did and to come to it. You know, we're all living in the same reality yeah. and we're all trying to figure it out, and yeah. I respect that for everybody. Yeah. And Anna, uh, is it public knowledge that you're writing a book too? Are you yes. mentioning that yet? Or? Yes, it okay. is official. So I, I actually have two books coming out. The one that's coming out in October 24 is um, called Re-Regulated. And the subtitle is, <laughs> see if I can have it memorized here. <laughs> Set yourself free from childhood PTSD symptoms and change the trauma-driven thinking that keeps you stuck. Yeah. And it's about a lot of this stuff. And it's got a lot of stuff about the daily practice with the FAQs and why it works, yeah. but also about the common patterns that I see as the real issues with trauma yeah. that are, it's the dysregulation, the disconnection okay. from people. There's a wound there that makes it hard to feel connected or part of a group. And that's hard. Mm -hmm. And I teach people how you can start to repair that. Mm -hmm. And then self-defeating behavior, the black yeah. and white thinking, the terrible relationships, the uh, addictions, mm -hmm. the anger, the yeah. clutter, <laughs> self-defeating <laughs> behavior like all yeah. the others. And it, it can be cleared up. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Well, Anna, so great to get to visit with you. Yeah. We'll load up the, all the links down below with all of your resources. So thank you so much. Thank you for joining us on the Minimal Mom Podcast. If you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with a friend who might find value in embracing a simplified life.